Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Mukassian, indeed, and Alex Mukassian, and I am the director of the electromicroscopy core, which belongs to the Notre Dame Integrated Imaging Facility. And you can find a lot of information about the facility and the core itself if you just Google Notre Dame Integrated Imaging Facility. It will be the first line, and then you go and make a tour along the facility and specifically along the electron microscopy core. Just very briefly, this core involves many electron microscopes. Now let's start with the scanning electron microscope, which in our scopes, which in our case includes Magellan 400 with a resolution 0.6 nanometers and full uh, EDS mapping. Also, we possess Helios G4 dual beam machine, which allows you uh, with resolution actually also around 0.6 nanometers. But the main idea that by using ion beam, you can make a lot of fancy stuff with using this device, including, let's say, slicing you with the full package of 3D reconstruction. Uh, as well as preparation of different TEM samples, starting with just conventional ceramics and ending, uh, let's say, soft materials. So on the other end, we do have a package uh, of the, uh, uh, let's say, transmission electron microscope. And the leader among them, of course, is Spectra 3300. Uh, so the, it means that it can operate uh, with the accelerating voltage from 30 kilo electron volt, which is used for the bio and soft materials and up to 300 kilo electron volts. So uh, this is a world record resolution on the order of 0.5 uh, angstroms, and I'm not kidding. So this machine also equips with the uh, two diagnostics. One is EDS mapping uh, uh, with uh, the, the option of the 3D reconstruction. And the second option is the EELS equipped with extremely fast K3 uh, camera, uh, which also in some sense allows 3D reconstruction uh, cases. So uh, also GEOL 2011 is the old machine which is widely used for training of students because at the same time, we also uh, the, uh, allow the uh, lecture course on the advanced electron microscopy and students also train to work on the GEOL uh, on the Joel machine. So very recently, we also purchased for the help Talos F200E, which uh, a, a little brother relative to Spectra, but uh, uh, also equipped with the uh, full EDS mapping and 3D reconstruction. Also uh, the uh, special, uh, special holders allows, for example, for you, to preheat your sample under the in situ conditions, then to pass the current through the sample or to freeze your sample uh, uh, at liquid nitrogen temperatures just for the soft materials. Uh, so uh, also we do have a couple of the E cells, which allows you to investigate your materials under operander conditions. So how does it work? In general, we have two options and that's very important. That and you know that just having an electron microscope as for me means nothing. You do have a high level specialist working on these machines, and that's what we are proud of. We do have a very strong team of uh, electron micros uh, of the electron microscopists, which are working on the uh, SEM dual beam and TEM machines. And uh, so indeed, you can come and work together with them on any kind to address any kind of your questions, but we have the other option also. You may come, be trained and use this machine uh, by yourself, uh, 724. So uh, we decided in order to provide you a little bit more deeper insight, so what information can be obtained with the help uh, of uh, this uh, machine diagnostics, so uh, we decided that two high-level specialists from the Thermo Fisher Scientific will make presentations and uh, so show you again. So what information, what questions can be addressed by using 
the microscopes which we do have in our core. So the first speaker, Jeff Permal, will talk about the scanning electron microscopes and after followed by Natalie Deval, which will give you idea about uh, the transmission electron microscopy uh, diagnostics and application for the life science. By this, uh, I want to give uh, time as well as space for Jeff Permal. Uh, he will talk about exploring volume electron microscopy approaches and advantages with single beam SEM and dual beam system. Please, Jeff. Thanks, Alex, for the introduction as well as the opportunity to speak. Um, if you all bear with me one second here, I'm going to share my screen. So yeah, I will spend the next approximately uh, 18 to 20 minutes discussing uh, some of the volume EM approaches specific towards life sciences. Um, I, I know that you've got this wonderful suite of tools, which I'm sure the material scientists are just churning away some great research on. So uh, what we're gonna spend this time is uh, exploring how we could apply these tools over towards biological applications, specific towards volume EM. So volume EM for biological samples um, usually begins with sample preparation. Um, cells or tissue are impregnated with heavy metals embedded into a resin. Um, and from there, we have a couple of different approaches, which we'll talk about in different slides. But the data you're looking at here is pretty uh, uh, exactly what you would expect to happen with some of these volume approaches. We serially ablate an image a uh, block face acquiring 2D stacks, which are turned into segmented 3D data sets, as you see here. In this case, we are looking at some neuro data. From there, we can continue down a pipeline to either, um, again, segmentation or some statistical analysis. So when I say volume EM, traditionally for a SEM or dual beam, we think of one of three approaches. Uh, First, working from left to right, being a slice and view with a dual beam, um, a focused ion beam tool, um, where we're imaging a block face with an electron beam and ablating away with an internal ion beam. Um, well, again, we'll dive through the differences of these uh, a little bit. Uh, the second being array tomography, which um, I always like to simplify for folks to essentially think of it as serial section TEM done inside of an SEM with a couple of differences. Uh, and lastly, um, serial block face, um, the, where we're actually putting our entire block face into a, uh, a SEM with a internal microtome where we're physically ablating away with a knife and imaging. So in some ways it's very comparable to that of FIB, but um, a little different in terms of field of view, Z resolution, um, but for today, we're gonna focus mainly on these two topics, uh, focused ion beam, dual beam with a Helios or array tomography. So a bit about these two techniques, um, you know, they seem kind of analogous. So why might one do one versus the other? Um, I usually like to break it down into these six categories, Z, X, Y resolution, Z resolution, your field of view. Uh, automation and charge control. Um, to me, when you decide the best approach to acquire your volume stack, uh, what I've highlighted here in red, are usually the best deciders on what is the appropriate approach. Um, being that X, Y, and resolution for these tools will be comparable because the E beams are gonna be about the same, but your Z resolution, um, the focused ion beam will always give you your best Z resolution of these techniques. When you're using a ion beam, you could ablate away down to a couple to a few nanometers. These are always gonna be sample dependent and sample tolerant. Your field of view will be another decider. Um, if you're looking at cells, a focused ion beam might be the best approach, but if you really wanna get the feel for tissues, what's happening in that larger context, array tomography being that um, we do have the ability or we're limited, let me rephrase that to um, your field of view is your, usually your diamond knife, which could be up to a couple to a few millimeters. Uh, field of view, if that's an uh, important qualification, then array tomography might be that best approach. And bear in mind, as well, by the way, as I go through these, or as I mentioned these two, I'm going to dive into each of these uh, as we uh, proceed through um, this. Z travel is another consideration, you know, depending on how much volume you absolutely need to acquire to uh, either do your statistics or do your segmentation. Focus ion beam, dual beams are always going to be a little bit more limited than that of array tomography to uh, tunes of 
about 20 or so microns in Z for a, a fib, whereas array tomography, um, it's essentially a limitless Z. It's going to be how much you want to section down onto either your wafer or your tape. And lastly, and my to me, in some ways, most importantly, automation of fib is always going to be much more automated than that of array tomography. And I can define automation not just as what happens inside the tool, but rather throughout the entire process. Um, for these two, after you embed, for most parts, uh, FIB sample goes right into the tool and then the ablation occurs. Array tomography, there's a couple of external steps which have to happen before any acquisition, namely counter staining after, as well as sectioning. So it's a little bit more manual. Um, why this is relevant is, um, and now I can't believe we're already into 24, but uh, at the beginning of 2023, Nature named volume electron microscopy as one of its techniques to really keep an eye out for. Um, as such, you know, this uh, quiet revolution has really uh, woken up and um, we're seeing a lot of renewed interest in these techniques. So for the case of your tools, as Alex kind of led us through all of the different microscopes, I'm gonna focus on two tools that Alex talked about the Magellan and the Helios. The Magellan is a single beam SEM, a very high resolution tool. Um, for these VEM techniques, which I discussed, the appropriate method would probably be using an array tomography approach for it. Um, and your Helios G4, um, being that again, it is a proper dual beam, uh, we would probably wanna go the way of slice and view, which is another term for fib trench milling as we just discussed before. So starting with array tomography, um, oh, my mouse or my computer seems to have frozen here, but let's, oh, there we go. Okay. So the idea, and excuse this choppy movie, is that you take a sample, which is embedded before we go inside the SEM sections are, or the, the uh, block is sectioned into a ultra microtone boat, as we're seeing here, these sections are linearized. And as the movie continues to progress, what we do is we pick up these sections and you can put it down onto a couple of different substrates. Um, in this case, we're looking at it placed down onto a chip, but you can put it down onto an indium tin oxide coated cover slip. Or if you need very, very large volumes, you can even use this contraption called an atom tome, which is kind of like that of a traditional tape reel. And it just can acquire up to thousands of sections at a time, regardless of which one you use, those sections are imaged in the order with which they come off. Um, at, after their image, you could either do a full field of view image or a specific ROI image. They are aligned as we see here, and then it could be brought into a post-analysis pipeline. So a little bit about this now into more detail, and please excuse my computer is just acting up here a little bit. So if we work from left to right here, um, what we're looking at here is the depiction of the linearized sections um, all of these little areas here are the sections. Um, there is specialized software, by the way, which we'll also talk about very near the end of this, which helps us to order these sections, identify ROIs as we see here in blue, um, do some alignment for precise precisioning, or excuse me, I'll do some precise precisioning and then do the back end alignment. So. Um, Bear in mind that what we're looking at here is a stack of 2D images. Um, so let's play this out a little bit more to really start to understand this pipeline. So what we're seeing here on the left is the actual ribbon of sections which are acquired. A individual ROI from each section is targeted for the high resolution images. Um, if we play this little blue box off here to the left, um, what we usually do is we set a mid mag to kind of really start to, to nail in on our, our region of interest. If you keep an eye this, uh, on this scale bar, 250 microns is, uh, is about, you know, a good field of view per ROI. You know, um, you can, as I mentioned, image the entire section, but you could fry out your computer or just kill a lot of memory. And if the idea is to really go through a lot of Z to target specific areas, as we now start to see here towards the bottom, is the most efficient way to qualify or to um, really target some of these areas for that high resolution imaging. So um, as I mentioned, these resolutions, you know, what we might wanna do as we work from left to right is choose a intermediate resolution of about you know, 50 to 100 nanometers so that we're efficiently imaging, but with good enough resolution to allow us to target a specific area 
for this ultimate high resolution data set. And here we go from about 250 to about 50 micro or 50 uh, nanometers resolution. Um, here that ROI is selected, and now we can start to choose. But bear in mind, you know, um, even though this is on an SEM, uh, for anyone who's familiar with neuroscience, you know, we're certainly able to make out synaptic vesicles in here. So, um, you know, the resolution is going to be good enough to allow us to do a lot of the things which serial section TEM permitted, but now on a much larger scale. From there, the data, as I was just mentioning, is aligned, and then we could do a couple of a few things. Here, we're looking at a cell which was um, segmented out, so many of the individual um, organelles, we could start to visualize the mitochondria in green, a lot of ER here in purple, um, some residual bodies in red, as well as the nucleus and nucleolus in blue. Um, being that we've individually segmented, we have our ability to look at them in context, or as we just saw previously, as individual um, organelles. Um, and now we're just going to do a little bit of fly through of that resultant data to really start to understand. Now, so to me, the power of volume is just what we're seeing here is it allows us to keep everything in context. 2D is wonderful. But when you really start to look at this throughout a full volume, we could start to understand how our mitochondria interact with our Golgi or our ERs organized. Um, it's really that that's what some of the power of this is going to be. And while I do always like to think of array tomography as a 3D technique or the community tends to fall back on it. I also do see array tomography as a powerful 2D technique as well. Um, so what we're looking at here actually is a little bit of 2D data. So again, very analogous to that of TEM, but um, another really popular buzzword that just continues to come back uh, to us is CLEM. So there is an approach which is analogous to that of array tomography with a couple of modifications to the prep which will allow us to stain the individual sections with fluorescence. Um, those sections can be imaged in a fluorescent microscope and then transferred into the SEM uh, after, and after a little bit of counterstaining to help improve uh, contrast to do what's commonly referred to as correlative array tomography. So we're correlating between our light micro microscope and our SEM, um, creating a higher resolution fluorescent data set than in some cases wide field could even accomplish. So that second technique of those two, which I mentioned is dual beam. So um, the idea behind this and similar to before, and I probably should have pointed it out is our electron beam creates secondary or backscatter electrons, which are then brought up to a detector, which allows us to create this image. So as I mentioned before, the FIB is always going to give us our best resolution, and that has to do with the fact that instead of a diamond knife, which we use for array tomography or serial block face, we are actually using a focused ion beam, which can bring that Z resolution for biological samples down to about five nanometers. If you prep really, really well, or if you're using a tissue, we could probably get down to two, three nanometers, but five is usually that sweet spot where I feel comfortable saying that most biological samples could be imaged for Z. So again, you know, we're we're decreasing our Z resolution, but we're also decreasing our field of view. So if you're doing an individual cell approach, this might be that better approach because it's going to give you that better resolution. Um, I'm actually, I'm gonna back up one second to point out one other thing, which I also failed to mention before is in this truth table of, do I want to use array tomography versus uh, FIB? Um, this is a really interesting part here. So array tomog tomography is archivable, meaning that after you image it in your SEM, you could store it away and come back to it. Focused ion beam serial block face is destructive. Once it gets inside of your system and once we ablate it away, it's gone. So, um, you know, more of those truth tables on what I want to do, um, you know, as you I start to think about this. So being that we were talking about a focused ion beam and it, for a lot of folks, it's a completely different methodology than that of a SEM. TEM folk could usually follow the path of a SEM. You know, we have an E column. Uh, with focused ion beam, we actually introduce a second beam as I just mentioned, probably a little bit at nauseum. And the idea behind it is our primary E beam, which is gonna do all of the acquisition and imaging meets at a coincident point with that of our focus ion beam, which is gonna do the ablation. In the case of um, the R tools, it's usually about four millimeters below the pole piece. At this coincident point, 
as we're also seeing here, we're able to do simultaneous ablation and acquisition. So there's no stage movements happening, which helps to speed up that actual acquisition. So for uh, life scientists, we take our EM block, which again has been heavy metal impregnated. The prep for this one is a little bit different than that of an array tomography because we don't have the opportunity to do post staining to help improve contrast. So during the EM prep, it's basically a modified TEM prep. We do add a little bit more heavy metals into it. So there's usually a lead uh, impregnation as well as a second osmium uh, impregnation to really bring out some contrast inside the tool. Once it gets inside of the FibSem, we rotate the block to about 52 degrees. So this slant, which you might be seeing here in the background is analogous to this block face. We open up this trench exposing this block base. And then from there, after all the prep is done, we could do that ablation acquisition, yielding our data, which is comparable to what we're seeing here. Now, this is a relatively large field of view, but again, with that same idea of the smallest feasible voxel. In this case, I believe this was imaged at about 10 nanometer voxel. So you know, we could go smaller, but um, you know, this is the uh, a good example of the data with which you can expect off of a fib. So, what is the value of three D? You know, I, I kind of hinted at it before. Um, let's see if I can get this movie to play here. Um, there we go. So here we're looking at some muscle which was imaged with a focused ion beam tool. Um, all of these 2D sections after they're aligned, as we've kind of mentioned before, can be segmented out. And now what we're looking at here is all of the mitochondria within this volume set, which, uh, which has been segmented out here in blue. Um, being that we do know our voxel sizes, um, I think this data set was acquired at five nanometers X, Y, and Z. We can continue the process after acquisition down the line into some statistics, uh, which we see here. Um, so the nice part about this tool is, or these suite of tools is that Amira, which is our analysis software, speaks nicely with a lot of these tools so that we could import not just the data, but also the metadata and get some statistical analysis. In this case, the, we measured the distance of the mitochondria from the fibers. Um, which uh, we're seeing output into this display here. Um, there's also, you know, obviously numerical values which can be associated with this as well. So we're, we've talked about the tools, we've talked about the data. The last little bits of this, which I do think are important is to understand that there are specialized softwares for each of these as well. So in the case of the dual beam, the Helios, there's, as Alex mentioned, the auto slice and view data, which allows us this workflow or um, we're, uh, software guided approach towards um, acquisition. So um, what we're looking at now is that same, or uh, this uh, depiction of that same uh, cartoon which we showed before, where we've cleaned out our um, prep work, we've exposed a clean block face, and we've placed down an X here, which is a good fiducial marker, which allows us to track our Z slices. Um, and then from here, the software will ask you, you know, how much Z do you want to acquire? What is your uh, resolutions that you're looking for? And then after it's put in, you basically have that set it and forget it approach because these acquisitions can take several hours to do. And it's not necessary for you to sit in front and babysit the computer. Similar to that, it would be the case for array tomography, where we use a software known as MAPS array tomography. You may hear it referred to as MAPS AT, which takes the same approach. Um, this has this more of this Photoshop feel to it, where we have different layers, which we can turn on and off to identify individual regions of interest. Um, what I think is really fun about this also is that if you did have multiple regions of interest and uh, you had more interest in, I guess we're looking at some neuro data here in synapses versus um, open areas is you could define your pixel densities so that your most interested area has that smallest pixel density and secondary areas of interest, maybe confirmatory cells, you could do at lower resolutions to allow you to maximize the amount of meaningful research you have as we go through these huge volumes of Z. So I think with that, in an effort to stay on my time commitment, I will 
Thank you all for your, the time. Um, as was mentioned at the top, I'll reiterate, uh, you know, we'll keep the questions till after Natalia's presentation to uh, give her a chance to go through hers as well. But um, thank you all very much. I will stop sharing and um, I'll pass the mic over to my colleague, Natalia Duvall. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, thank you, Alex, for the introduction as well. So I will go ahead and share my screen. So hopefully all the logistics works here. Um, if you have any problem hearing me or seeing my screen, please let me know. So I hope everything is good so far. Okay, so uh, uh, Jeff, my colleague, really did an amazing introduction about what can be done on the FIPSEN side. And I will focus on the transmission electron microscope and mostly as well, you know, what can be done at the uh, Notre Dame uh, core facility. So uh, with that being said, uh, I will start first, sorry about that, uh, introducing a bit of different techniques. I know we have around 40 people attending the seminar today, and I know uh, we have different backgrounds. We have people here, like they are experts in electron microscopy already. We have people like they are starting to do some electron microscopy work. And we have people as well, like they are a bit new uh, to electron microscopy. So in that regard, I want to spend a few minutes uh, to put everyone on the same page. Uh, so you can really understand the value of adopting uh, electron microscopy in your research. So here uh, you can really visualize, and let me put maybe my pointer. So uh, we have different techniques uh, for imaging. So in green, you can see light microscopy, super resolution, and the conventional TNSEM. Like they are very good technologies uh, if you really want to have a large uh, field of view, uh, but obviously uh, you are losing um, resolution. On the other part of the spectrum, uh, in purple, we have NMR and crystallography. Like again, they are very, very uh, convenient and uh, uh, good techniques if you are really looking uh, to high resolution results, but you are working with very small specimens, uh, so at the atomic level. And uh, here uh, in between, uh, in blue, uh, we have electron tomography, can be room temperature and can be cryo, and single particle uh, electron microscopy as well. Again, room temperature and cryo. And these techniques are very good in the sense like you can uh, really get a bit of everything. You can still get, especially if you are working under cryo conditions, the resolution you are looking for, uh, but you can still visualize uh, much larger volumes and uh, much larger specimens like you can do with NMR or crystallography. So it's a very good balance in between having the resolution you need and uh, having the field of view you are looking for. Uh, I want to emphasize, you know, uh, before uh, switching to uh, cryo-electron microscopy, I was myself a crystallographer. So my PhD is all in crystallography. And, uh, you know, when I decided to jump to cryo-EM or EM in general, uh, you know, my, my friends, my co-workers at that time, they were telling me what the hell you are doing. I mean, you are going to real resolution to the thing that we call before the blobology, you know, because a few years ago, electron microscopy uh, was still a blobology arena, because if you get already 20 to 15 Armstrong resolution uh, by cryo, it was already very good. So time, times are evolving very quickly, technologies are changing, and as you can see here, you know, uh, we analyze a bit of the main three techniques like we currently, structural biologists uh, use uh, to analyze their samples. So you have crystallography in, in blue. Uh, it's still one of the main techniques uh, like it has been using for years and it's still very heavily used. Uh, you have NMR, like it's kind of a plateauing right now, you know, and you have cryo -EN. So cryo -EN, we are expecting a, a, a bigger, uh, even bigger than right now, uh, a, you know, a exponential growth in the next probably five years, even before that. So uh, one of the advantages of uh, cryo electron microscopy, if you compare with crystallography or NMR, is that first of all, you don't need any crystals. Uh, so that's a huge advantage. You know, everyone here in the audience, I'm confident, uh, you have been trying to crystallize uh, some proteins, mostly small proteins, membrane proteins, and they are very difficult to crystallize. So 
using electron microscopy, you don't need to do that anymore. So you need very small amount of material. Again, uh, when you are doing crystallography or even NMR, uh, the amount of material needed is usually very high. And depending on the protein, the sample you are working with, can be very difficult to express and purify that amount of material. So another very, very huge advantage of using electron microscopy. Uh, and again, you can really work with very heterogeneous or relatively heterogeneous samples. So, you know, different advantages to really start adopting electron microscopy in your research. I want to highlight, like, again, cryo-EM is really growing very fast as a structural biology method for characterizing proteins and pathogens. And, uh, you know, as you know, proteins are really essential uh, for understanding, you know, life functions, from grout to repair to metabolism to structure and disease. So understanding the structure of those proteins and how they really interact with each other in the body is really, really important to really develop new therapeutics. So I have several examples here very quickly to let you know how electron microscopy is really impacting human health. So for example, you can see here in the left, uh, using electron microscopy in this particular case was single particle analysis. Uh, we were able to really understand a new uh, tutopathy. This job was done in collaboration with Source Search in the UK. In the middle, you can see again using tomography as well as single particle analysis, we were able to really understand how new antibodies can bind to Ebola and uh, Sudan uh, viruses and really understand and develop new therapies. This work was done in collaboration with Professor Erika Orman Sapphire in La Jolla Institute for Immunology. And the last example I want to highlight today, but there are plenty out there. Uh, so it was done in collaboration with the Stanford. Um, this small uh, kinase is a very small uh, you know, membrane protein, very, very difficult and challenging to crystallize using electron microscopy, uh, mostly single particle analysis we were able to obtain the 3D reconstruction of this protein. So we can visualize the protein in 3D and we, we really can understand knowing the structure, we can really develop new therapeutics like antibodies and vaccines. So again, uh, very quickly to put everyone on the same page, uh, three main techniques for transmission electron microscope. You have the single particle analysis, like is really very, very uh, the way to go. Uh, when you are working with recombinant proteins. So you still need to express and purify the protein of interest or the complex of interest. And you uh, put that uh, when the complex is purified in the transmission electron microscope, you take the data you need and you will be able to obtain in 3D, uh, you know, high resolution 3D, the volume uh, of your protein of interest. Um, the main disadvantage of that technique is that you have very high resolutions, uh, almost atomic resolutions, depending on your sample, but you are still working on ex situ. So you still need to express and purify the protein of interest. However, if you really want to really understand what is going on in situ in the context of the cell, in the context of the tissue, you are working with tomography. This can be done, again, room temperature or cryo applications. So that is very convenient because you can really target the protein of your interest in the context of your cell or the tissue and really visualize uh, by tomography, obtain a 3D volume of that protein of interest in the context of your cell. So it's very convenient because you will be able to really understand how that protein is interacting with other proteins. You know, proteins are like human beings. Uh, they don't like to work uh, alone. They really like to work in a team. So understanding how that protein interacts with other proteins of interest in the context of the cell can really help you to really understand the biology behind that protein. And of course, we have the microelectron diffraction, like it's a mixing between crystallography and uh, electron microscopy. You still need to have a small crystals, very, very tiny, between 200 to 500 nanometers, like you cannot use for crystallography, but you will be able to use for micro ED. So once you have those crystals, you can, uh, you know, beautify those crystals at minus 180 degrees Celsius. And after, you know, transfer that grid with your crystals in there to the transmission electron microscope, localize the crystal of interest and start collecting data on that specific crystal. 
So this will be the technique that will provide you with the highest resolution similar to the crystallography resolution that you will be able to get. Uh, but mostly people are using microelectron diffraction to work with the small compounds, natural compounds. Some people are already starting to use micro ED as well for proteins, but the challenge is like you still need to have crystals. So micro ED will provide you with the highest resolution. After that single particle analysis, you can really obtain near atomic resolutions and finally tomography to really work in situ. So what can be done with the instruments you already have in-house in Notre Dame? So uh, you can do different things, you know, and I don't want to spend that much time going one by one with all the specifications of the instruments. You know, Alex is the expert here and you can ask him if you want to know more details. I know we have as well in the call uh, two of the colleagues from the material science part. So Lee and uh, 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 Jean Smith. So they, you have some specific, specific questions regarding the material science applications for the configuration, you can ask them. But I can explain to you like with this specific configuration for uh, the Talos, as well as for, uh, you know, the Spectra, uh, you can already do plenty of different things uh, for life science applications. So again, even if the instruments, they were configured for the material sciences, uh, this can be used as well for already plenty of applications for life sciences. Some examples. So for example, you can already do uh, uh, some cryo as well applications. You can do room temperature applications, single particle tomography, and even micro ED. But of course, you can as well do uh, cryo applications. You can use the bit robot to prepare the sample uh, for vitrification purposes, so minus 180 degrees Celsius. So your sample don't have any artifacts, you know, it's almost like a native uh, environment for your sample. And after you can uh, transfer that cryo samples into the talos or even the spectra at 300 kilo. So this is uh, some examples, hopefully this can work. There are different videos in between what kind of differences you can get in between the talos uh, you have already in Notre Dame in-house versus if you are working with a glacios, like is more or less the equivalent to the talos, but uh, mostly for all life sciences applications. So as you can see, the resolutions are a bit different, uh, you know, because uh, in the talos, this is the kind of uh, work you can do, for example, for uh, low contrast liposomes, for tomography. If you go with the glacios here, you can see the resolutions are higher. And another big difference is on the glacios, you will be able to keep collecting data for longer periods of time. Like you have a bit more limited time of collection in the talos, and like you currently have in house. But again, this can be done uh, for cryo applications. More examples as well. Uh, this is a uh, high contrast uh, for both material and life sciences. So, for example, this is a, a, a work like it was done, you know, on the talos F200, you know, at uh, 80 kV. So you can see the CETA camera and you can see the differences and the kind of resolutions and the details you will be able already to see uh, easily with your uh, talos or even the spectra as well. So both can be used for this kind of work. Uh, another example here, and this is coming directly already with uh, PIs and scientists in Notre Dame. Like I know for a fact they are already using the facility there. And thank you so much for being willing to share the data that like you are already collecting there with Alex and Sarah. So this is already to highlight what kind of work can be done. So you can already do some STEM work. Uh, in this case, it's E. coli. You can as well do uh, some TEM analysis, negative stain samples for uh, nanoparticles. So you can already see the quality of the particles here. And obviously as well, uh, you can go ahead and do some cryo uh, analysis, in this case as well, nanoparticles for cryo. So all this work has been coming already out of the oven, I will say, uh, from the facility you have in Notre Dame. So everything can be done very, very easily, working in collaboration with Sarah and, and, and Alex, and of course with us in Termo. So with that, I hope uh, we are still plenty of time for some questions. So uh, feel free to scan this QR code. You will have my contact information, a phone number, email address. If we can know address every single question you have uh, right now during the seminar, please feel free to reach out to me directly to this QR code. 
and I will be following up with the rest of the questions. And with that, thank you so much for your time. Alex, maybe I can just start with one. Um, do you have the software on board um, at, at your core facility? And is there like a charge to use that or they have to come to your facility to use the software? Okay, good question. <laughs> so yes, first of all, we do have, and that's I want to say, for example, so it was slice and view in the 3D reconstruction was mentioned. We have the full package of uh, software. Uh, Moreover, we even have a, uh, specially trained specialists, which will help you to make this 3D reconstruction. And so this is for free for the users. I mean that you pay it only for the hours you spent on the microscopes, then you grabbed all the data, then you come and by using some different uh, computers and di in different room, even you just take care of the reconstruction, which is just free for the users. And we have, uh, yeah, so TEM 3D reconstruction as well as SEM 3D reconstruction. We do have experience. We published papers on this matter. So in pretty good shape. So just come and use. So I just want to outline, So, and, but everybody know that, but I want to make a statement. So as we believe, 75 to 80% of the quality of the final information or data you, are, you obtain depends on the sample preparation. And that's a special issue and you have to be ready to work on this issue. And again, we are happy to help you working on it. And do you have uh, users that are external to Notre Dame that are using your um, electron microscopes? Yes, we do have external users. Of course, the charges for the industrial users, extender, external university users are different, but yes, we do. Do they generally send you samples or they come in person to? Uh, no, again, so the point is in general, you understand, as I explained, we do have two options. You can work with the specialist, you can be trained. So now inside the option of working with the specialist, of course, we prefer if the scientists or just come and work together. It's much more efficient, but we do have examples when they just send the samples. Now, typically for the first sample, we work together, then we understand what question should be addressed and focused on, and then you can just send the samples and we will work and then send the reports to you. Great. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. Um... Is the core doing CLEM currently? And if so, is the sample prep different? I'm Believe certainly it. glad to help out with the second part of the question, um, the prep. And um, yes, um, so uh, most of these techniques that we discussed is a modified TEM approach. So resin embedding, heavy metals, dehydration. For CLEM though, um, being that we want to save the antigenicity, we modify the prep so it's a different resin. So instead of an EPON or an LX112, typically acrylic resins are used for the embedding and um, the heavy metals are omitted, the osmium, the urinal acetate, in the case of uh, these volume approaches, the thiocarbohydrazide, again, to help preserve your antigenicity. So um, I'll finish with one part, which is the annoying answer, but it's the truth, which is a uh, Clem is such a tailored protocol, so it's always kind of good to know what you're interested in, cells, tissue, and you know what your goal is. And uh, typically, Clem protocols are not just taken from a standardized, uh, you know, one protocol fits all and uh, personalized to your experiment. No, again, so I may add a little bit. So. So different samples, right? Different materials, they require some specific approach for sample preparation. And we do have in some sense the protocol to do that. So typically, so the users first find out some previous publications uh, on the materials close or similar to all they want to investigate. They sent us this uh, PDF file. We analyze inside our group. And then we suggest the protocol and then the users may come and we are working together uh, on the uh, uh, this protocol of sample preparation. 
So then the prepared sample uh, just uh, investigated on SEM or TEM, it depends on the level of resolution you need. And then uh, so adjustments uh, typically is made based on sample, again, as I mentioned, sample preparation is very important step and sometimes it takes even longer time to prepare the sample in the right way in order to get a reliable resolution then to get the TEM on SEM data. So again, uh, so we are welcome, and uh, you're welcome to come and work together with us. We are, we are happy to help you in the, in the development of the protocol of sample preparation. I don't think that there is some unique or uh, not unique, uh, some general approach. Every time some specific uh, mm -hmm. procedure, some specific line should be added in order to get a good quality sample. I am right, Jeff? I agree fully. Um, yeah, it's really tough to uh, just take one protocol and assume it's going to work, whether it's tissues, cells, you know, depending on what your labeling interests are. Um, so yeah, fully agree, Alex. I have a technical question on the TM side. Uh, I'm just wondering if the EPU software can be installed on the Talos or Spectra for like a single particle analysis. I understand that it's like a... These two microscopes are not the best microscope for the single particle analysis, but still for the, like, let's say for the screening purpose. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. And yes, uh, of course, these microscopes, uh, they were configured for material sciences applications to start with, but again, uh, we have some flexibility to add uh, some life sciences applications as well. Uh, so GPU, yes, uh, uh, can be can be installed. I don't I don't think it's gonna be any problem to add any software. Uh, I will need to double check with my material sciences colleague to see what kind of uh, Windows do you have. I believe it's Windows ten should be Windows ten, you know. And maybe Alex or Sarah already know that. But once you have the Windows ten there, uh, you should be able to install a GPU there as well to do a single particle analysis. Okay, thank you. Of course. Good luck. <laughs> There's the another, next, another yeah. question in the core. Um, are FFPE, or I'm sorry, in, in the chat, are FFPE human tissues suitable for VEM? What is the typical tissue dimension for VEM? So, really, no for the first part. Um, Formalin fixation um, is just not ideal for electron microscopy, whether it's early volume or even in traditional TEM, it's just not good of enough of a fix. And also the paraffin, or the paraffin part's gonna be problematic. I would probably suggest if you do have the tissue to go the way of traditional fixation, you know, two, two and a half percent glutaraldehyde, some paraffinaldehyde and cacodylate buffer, that'd be the other difference. I optimize it for EM. Um, the second part, the typical tissue dimensions, um, really you're limited by the osmium, in my opinion, for volume. Um, as long as one of your three dimensions is a millimeter or less, I think you're in pretty good shape. Osmium penetrates at a rate of, I think it's like a half millimeter per hour or something like that. And you want to make sure that it infiltrates from both sides. Um, as for uh, that, that second dimension or that third dimension, um, you're kind of, if, if you're going the way of a ray tomography, you're limited by the width of your diamond knife. I think most diamond knives are about three millimeters or so, four millimeters. You can buy those larger diamond knives, which are like six millimeters. Um, so really the, the limitation is going to be what size diamond knife you're working with. Uh, but beyond that, as long as one of your dimensions is mil one millimeter, then you should be fine and you should not run into uh, any issues with infiltration. Um, I'd also just say, you know, if you're going bigger, then uh, probably, you know, extend your embedding times a little bit or your infiltration times. Uh, but the last comment I'll make on that is it's always good to start smaller and then work bigger. I mean, a lot of these protocols have been optimized at one millimeter cubed. Uh, again, as I said, you could go bigger, but I'm always of the belief of scale up instead of start big, fail and figure out where you failed. You know, I also want to mention, uh, just to put your attention specifically, I mentioned that we have Spectra 3300. It means that this microscope 
uh, with uh, can work at accelerating voltage thirty kilovolt volt, volt, and uh, so which uh, I believe uh, unique conditions for TEM, uh, especially used for the soft material and biomaterial, which allows you to keep material safe um, for the long period of time. I uh, so the uh, Natalia mentioned that somehow the uh, recording time in TEM less than in the cryo TEM for the reason is very understandable why, but if you are using lower accelerating voltage, you can apply so it to the uh, sample without destroying it for the longer period of time, thus having the higher resolution, uh, something like that. Is anything else uh, our speakers would like to share? <laughs> I mean, I, I can't speak for Natalia, although I think I'm probably right. Uh, we're glad to share our contact information. I know Natalia did. I'm glad to share mine. If uh, any follow-up questions do come along, uh, I think we both enjoy talking about the actual data as much as the microscope. So uh, feel free to think of us as a resource. No, I would again... like to thank you, the organizers as well, you know, Alex and Sarah and you, Gil, everyone in the consortium for inviting us today here. And... You know, I still have time until January the 15th, so happy new year to everyone. <laughs> uh, and again, Notre Dame Integrated Imaging Facility it has a very nice website. It's easy to find it. And on this website, you can find any contact information and uh, much more details uh, on the options which we do have at Notre Dame Integrated Imaging Facility. Thank you.